We have uh, these budget problems in the Chula Vistas all over this country, the Sacramento's all over this country, and Washington, D.C. itself. Uh, but as far as speaking just of California, all of these budgetary problems have ensued from the massively growing extreme differential in wealth among our people. Over the, it's been getting worse and worse for the past 40, 50 years. And I wonder if you think there's any way at all, to, if not to rectify this uh, nationally, you can't do anything about that, but is there anything to be done about it in, in California? Can we increase the income tax on whatever percentage of billionaires California has of the 500 U.S. billionaires, not to mention the scores, if not hundreds, of near billionaires? Um, is there any way to begin to rectify this situation? Because you know, extreme wealth inequality is going to lead one way, and that's back to the Dark Ages. That's the way it was from the Dark Ages. The king owned everything, and everybody else owned nothing. And it's a severe problem, and everybody's suffering because of it everywhere, in every town in California, mm -hmm. the state as a whole. Have you guys had a chance to consider this, which I see as the crux of all of this country's problems, extreme wealth inequality getting worse every day. Yeah, well, wealth inequality is a very um, important issue and one that Lorena has worked very hard to help correct. One of the best ways to do that, we believe, is democracy in the workplace. Uh, when, uh, when workers are allowed the ability to you know, form a union, 70% of the time they do that. Um, and that, that has not changed and obviously you've seen a lot of that gap between in the inequality that you're talking about happen as you've seen also the decline of unions over the last four years. So that's one approach that she's just taken and what she works on every single day. I don't think that's the only answer. Lorena would agree. Um, but I think what, what is clear is, you know, Steve's talked about it right now, we had Prop 30 and Prop 30 was more, a little more progressive than a sales tax. And I think we're in a position where we want to see how that plays out. Um, we're not, Lorena's not for raising new taxes at the state level. Um, instead, there are opportunities to grow the middle class tax base. Um, here's an example. I think this is, that might actually be a place where we differ, uh, differ on the position. The, the, the um, topic of enterprise zones. Now, I think I've seen Steve say he wants to expand enterprise zones, and there's a lot of good reasons why to do that. However, we've seen areas where the enterprise zones have become a loophole for big industries, big um, multinational companies, uh, the Walmarts of the world, right, where five people control you know, a, a large percentage of the, the total wealth in our country. Um, and there's not a real incentive that's provided to a group like Walmart or Taco Bell or KFC or Verizon or some of these big multinational retailers that dot the landscape of our country anyway to come to Chula Vista or the South Bay Enterprise Zone, right? Now for a small business, it makes a ton of sense. For NASCO, having that enterprise zone is absolutely crucial to retaining jobs in California in San Diego Bay out there. However, we're at a place now where there's a crisis. The Enterprise Zone program is chewing up more of our budget on a year-over-year -year basis than any other item in the, in the California state budget. 30% a year growth for this tax subsidy that is enjoyed overwhelmingly by big corporations that would be doing business here anyway. Enterprise Zones is a job it's supposed to be a job creation incentive. Come to this area and we will provide you with a tax credit so that you can hire people locally. Unfortunately, we've seen things like retroactive vouchering where you could open a business and then you could say, oh, you know what, I can go claim somebody that I hired five years ago and I can get $30,000 tax credit for that, right? Well, sooner or later, we start adding up. The problem is that there's also no incentive that these create good jobs. So instead, we have a tax system right now that's full of loopholes like this Enterprise Zone program that we're not just, we're just not just incentivizing or creating a new subsidy 
for Walmart to do business here, but we're they're double dipping. We're hitting they're hitting us on the other end because they're putting they're going to be throwing everyone into Medicaid. They're going to be throwing everyone into the free uh, free school lunch program to subsidize housing. Right? Those are not the priorities of our state. We are not trying. Nobody sat down. At least nobody that agrees with Lorena sat down and said we should pri we should make a tax loophole program like the Enterprise Zones that benefit big companies that are going to do business in our neighborhoods anyway to pay minimum wage jobs right with no benefits they said we're going to do this for the NASCOs we're going to do this for light manufacturing we're going to do this for technology that might not otherwise come to this enterprise zone area because and that is where we think we need to reinvest and start doing it. that's what Lorena believes too how that deals with your inequality is because you are allowing that flattening or even depression of wages to go forward with a program like the Enterprise Zone program. I'm actually thinking, I didn't ask the question well enough as I wish I had. I'm thinking of fair share taxation. Mm -hmm. It's people who made their hundreds of millions and billions of dollars and so many of them just refused to give back. And that's where it becomes, you know, the responsibility of uh, the people and their representatives to uh, force them to pay their fair share like this country used to do even in the Eisenhower years. Anybody making over a million dollars had to pay 91% of that. Now you have people making 50 million dollars a year like Warren Buffett who admits, to his credit, uh, he pays a lower tax rate than the secretary. And that's what I'm talking about, fair share taxation. Could you do anything? Uh, have you, uh, there's so many other things on your mind, I understand. Could you do anything when you go to Sacramento to start talking to your colleagues and say, look, these people have to start paying their fair share for the communities who've made their wealth possible? Well, you want to support the 91% tax bracket? <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, I, we have seen an erosion in the middle class. We've seen, we've seen the middle class lose, lose money, and we're seeing it day by day. Uh, I believe um, that passing uh, punitive taxes against people that have an ability to invest and chasing them to places like Nevada and Arizona probably isn't going to serve us. The, the best way because if you look at it actuarially if we basically pass such sort of punitive tax codes anybody that has anything is going to get out of here I mean there's a reason people have money is because they don't like to spend it right and, and, and they're not going to give it away so what we end up with is a state full of people that are looking for jobs they're looking for investment they're looking for um, an ability to run their own businesses. Uh, I think what we ought to do, I think what we ought to do, and again, I, I, I'm not sure that I, you know, I want a bunch of Taco Bells uh, getting subsidized. I, I don't, that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about shipyards. I'm talking about good jobs. People, uh, jobs that people can uh, raise a family on, have hopes to buy a home, uh, invest in their community, care about their community. Uh, not not jobs that are that are suited for you know for folks that are just getting out of high school and stuff like that. So that that's not just expanding an enterprise zone doesn't mean that I you know I want to uh, dump a bunch of low wages jobs. That's that's not it at all. So it, it the situation is is that what do you do to, to to sort of equalize that? And the fact is is that we have to create incentives for investment. We've got to have an ability and a, and a business climate that is going to allow people to open businesses here and be successful. You know, I, I said in, in, in the Union Tribune, we can't tax ourselves into prosperity. It's not going to work. Look what's happening in places like Greece and Spain and, and Cyprus and everything. I mean, these places are, they're unraveling at the seams. And so we can't, I mean, I, I would not support that. Uh, what I would like to do is look at what some of the things that we're doing as a state that's not adding value and see whether or not there are changes that we can make that will allow people to come in here and invest and create jobs for the kids coming out of college 
for Mr. Coda and his family that essentially is coming back from Iraq and is just trying to, you know, pay his bills and raise his kid in a nice, safe environment, you know, and, and, and hopes of moving up through the ladder, because that's what we all want. You know, right now it's, <clears throat> you know, I mean, it's kind of like government jobs. That's what people, that's what people are, really, I mean, that's where people are making money right now. If you look at all the jobs that are being created in the state, now we are starting to see some healthcare jobs and things like that. But for the last 18 months, as we started to see the rebound sort of take shape, <clears throat> we've got service jobs that are being created and construction jobs. And we all know that construction jobs don't last forever. They come and go with the cycles. And so what we really need to do is see an improvement in our unemployment and our employment picture that has long-term sustainable jobs that are based on an economy that's going to keep that ball rolling and keep it growing. And so I don't have all the answers. I'm not an economist, but I know that we're doing things that are chasing jobs out of this state. I mean, we've got dairy farms that were chased out of the L.A. Basin because they didn't meet the air. I mean, we're talking about cows. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's been proven. There's, there are some impacts to that. But they were basically chased out of L.A. because they couldn't meet the smog, you know, the carbon um, dioxide requirements. Yeah. So then they moved to the Central Valley, and now they're all going to Nevada. Yeah. And you know what? They're just on the other side of the state line. You know, that little sort of imaginary line that, you know, you sort of step across and you're in another state, that air, the air quality in that area is still being affected. I think so what you're telling me is that we, this is something that can't be done on the state level. It has to be done on the national level. No, so I think, can't yeah, escape I to think another state think, to escape Yeah, the I think nationally we need tax reform. <laughs> yeah, I mean, do I want Mitt Romney's tax bracket? I sure do. I'd like to pay what that guy pays. You know, and, uh, you know, it's tough for us. It's tough for us. So, yeah, I, I, you know, there are things we can do in the state to, to, to sort of, I think there are things that we can do in the state. I just want to throw up my hands and say that what, what happens in Sacramento doesn't affect the ability to create good jobs because I think it has a lot of effect on that. I think what happens at City Hall has the ability to create good jobs. I mean, we all have a role to play in this recovery. And we've got to make sure that what we're doing isn't negatively affecting the recovery. So, <clears throat> You know, I, I, I can't put it any more plainer than that. Well, actually, you guys are going to need to summarize real fast because we're running out of time here and the library is going to close on us. <laughs> uh, no, I, am I summarizing as in giving this in, uh, closing or am I answering the question? Well, uh, We'll find out either way. Either way, closing actually, unfortunately. Yeah, we got a couple more minutes. Okay, well, I think it, I can do both at the same time. So, you talked about tax fairness, and I think that's important, you know. Um, one of the things, uh, we talked a little bit about Prop 30 today, and Prop 30 is better than what we started with. Prop 30 actually has some graduated um, progressive components to it, and it's not just a regressive sales tax. Guess what? People don't want to pay progressive sales taxes, especially, you know, we talked a little bit about the people of this community. They're the ones that are most disproportionately hit, and I think what you talked about was, um, you know, this fair share taxing. I think it would be very difficult to argue that Prop 30 isn't more of a fair share tax than the straight one-half sales tax that the governor wanted, right? Um, and that took some work, and that took some compromise. And that was something that Lorena was able to help work on by facilitating a conversation between, you know, all these people that wanted the millionaires tax, right? And you know, they had a lot of good, valid points for wanting a millionaires tax. And then you had the governor who was trying to, I think, appease other, you know, communities that he thought he really needed in order to, you know, push the boulder up the hill to get 50% for a sales tax. Well, it took people to say, hey, you guys put competing measures on the ballot. This is not going to go good. So one of the things we did is we facilitated a discussion at our Better San Diego Community Coalition that Lorena started. Um, and, you know, as we got closer and closer to that thing where the two of them were going to have to hash it out in public for the first time, what do you know? The Wednesday before we see a press release, there's a deal, there's a compromise, right? Meanwhile, we've been talking to them over and over. What is, you know, what is going to happen with this? Are you going to be able to do that? 
Now, there were a lot of people that participated in that conversation. A lot of people that contributed to the discussion about what a new revenue measure should look like. But Lorena has certainly gone out of her ways to be you know, entrepreneurial about opportunities when it comes to solving problems. And I think that's a really good example and some of the reasons why we're hopeful you'll be supporting our uh, candidacy for State Assembly. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you, first of all, for um, staying with us tonight. Uh, first of all, you know, it's not Prop 30 and whether or not that was the right thing to do or anything. It's about what promises were made to the people who supported that initiative and how that money was going to be spent. And how, what effect that additional revenue is going to have on the improvement of education for our kids. That's really what it's all about. And, and Evan's right, time will tell. But what we're starting to see, you know, what we're hearing is that it's not going to have, at least from some districts, it's not going to have the beneficial effect we were told it was going to have. If you look at community college, you look at Southwestern, they've cut uh, about 25 to 30 percent of their courses. You know, a two-year AA degree now takes three years because courses aren't available to the kids that want them. Even if they're on a even if they're on a course to take all of their you know the required courses as well as the electives, just the ability of them to get the courses that they need is not there. So you know I haven't heard a plan on how it's going to be fixed. Now I've, I've heard the governor talk about um, some reforms and I approve those. I agree with those. With those. But he's getting he's getting um, backlash from some of the special interests that you know don't want to see reform take hold and so it's you know it was just in the LA Times today about you know he's 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 in for the long hard fight you know and it and you begin to wonder whether it's about teaching our kids or giving young people an education or whether it's about jobs for you know government workers you know and I I think we can do both, but we have to be, all be fair. We have to understand why government's there. It's there to basically provide services to the people that pay the bills and help people that can't, you know, that can't pay taxes or whatever, can't, don't have that and, and, and be that safety net and making sure that they have uh, the ability to, to make a living as well. <clears throat> you know, so, you know, that's really what the difference is here. And so, you know, I mean, uh, and I'll just, I'll just close. I, I have served this community for uh, nearly 20 years. Uh, I've been here. Uh, a lot of people know where I live. I see a lot of people in the restaurants and stores. And, and, and I know this community. And I know South San Diego because I've, I've been here. My son was baptized, you know, uh, in Nestor. And, and so, I, you know, I have roots here. I'm not going anywhere. And, uh, you know, I think I'm in a better position to represent this community. I know what the problems are. I know what the needs are. I don't have all the answers, but you know, I think I come with a good perspective on what's important for this community. And I think that's going to help me if I do get to Sacramento to ensure that whatever I'm working on and whatever I'm talking about, um, is going to reflect nicely on this community. And so that's the way I've conducted myself in Chula Vista, and that's the way I hope to conduct myself in Sacramento. Thank you.